This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Uh, right, if everybody's ready, um, I'm now wearing a different hat, so to speak, chairing this session, which will, uh, in which we have the, will have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Gabriella Beckles Raymond. And I'd like to introduce her before she gives her paper. Gabriella is originally from Northwest London. We discovered in the break that we grew up in almost the same area, and currently resides there. She completed most of her studies in the United States, first leaving England to attend Morgan State University on a basketball scholarship. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Psychology while at Morgan, then returned to England briefly and completed a PGCE in secondary education. However, the United States called again, and at the beginning of 2002, Gabriella went back to Morgan State to head up the Academic Enrichment Program, AEP. There she developed and managed campus-wide support services for undergraduate students, and while at the AEP, she completed her MA in Sociology and did extensive graduate studies in higher education administration and leadership. Gabriella then relocated to Tennessee, where she earned her MA in 2008 and doctorate in Philosophy in 2011 from the University of Memphis. Having returned home to London and started a family, Gabriella is currently a lecturer in the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Canterbury Christ Church University. Her research aims to broaden philosophical discussions of race and gender in Britain. She draws on her multidisciplinary background and her experiences both as a student and administrator, working at a historically black university and graduating from a department that has proud, a proud tradition of producing black women philosophers. She is currently working on a chapter for an upcoming anthology, Philosophy and the Mixed Race Experience published by Lexington Books, which will be part of a series entitled On the Philosophy of Race, and will soon begin a project as co-editing a women of colour anthology for a feminist philosophy series for Pickering and Chatham publishers. Gabrielle. I'm not sure if it's customary to begin philosophical talks with a shout out, but I have to recognise the people that support me and help me here. So I just wanted to mention my husband, Philip Beckles Raymond, my sister, Lucy Beckles, distinguished professor, Dr. Lawson, and more recently, Robert Beckford, who, um, like I say, have supported me in this journey through this crazy world that is philosophy. So thank you to them. Right, just a quick note, I will be using the PowerPoint slides as you can see, but I'm not going to actually talk through the slides, they're merely meant as a visual aid just to trigger thoughts as we go through the talk, so um, just bear that in mind. Um, I'm going to start out just kind of setting the scene that gave rise to this paper. Um, secondly, but the first section of the paper, I will analyse the kind of concept that I want to use here, and then the following three sections will discuss in more detail, I'll give um, examples, um, relating to that idea. So, let us begin. In summer 2012, along with almost 27 million people in Britain and hundreds of million more globally, I sat down to watch the opening ceremony for the Olympics. Living in London, I was engulfed by the controversies and excitement leading up to the Games. So as a lover of sport, I was intrigued and grateful that the Games were about to begin. How would we present ourselves to the world? How would we follow the miraculous display in Beijing? <coughs> As it turned out, the response to the ceremony at home and abroad was resoundingly positive, a night of wonder the Guardian declared on its front page the following day. Even responses that spoke to confusion were interpreted in a positive light, quirky, wacky, eccentric, etc. Whether home or abroad, the prevailing sentiment to the mishmash celebration of culture, history, and comedy seemed to be that Danny Ball put on a show that was quintessentially British. Such a description of British culture invariably contains a hint of irony. It's not uncommon for Britain to elude def definitions of national character, precisely because it is framed as a nation of contradictions, complexity and diversity. Former Labour deputy leader Roy Hattersley's musings on the ceremony are indicative. Quote, Presumably he, Danny Boyle, hoped to capture the ethos of the whole host nation. But it is hard to feel romantic or even sentimental about anything as amorphous as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And it is near impossible to identify characteristics that are common to the Cotswold and the Gorbals, the Falls Road and the Brecon Beacons, without taking refuge in references to this happy breed, a bogus description of the English written by Shakespeare before the kingdoms were united." End quote. Nevertheless, artistic choices have to be made. 
and for Danny Boyle's vision, a young mixed race woman became the face that would represent this happy breed in the musical romp through contemporary British culture and history. Danny Boyle is not alone in this choice. Images of women racialized as mixed adorn billboards everywhere, advertising everything from chocolate to financial services. They are the face of social campaigns and serve as some of the best ambassadors for cultural expression Britain has to offer. So what are we to make of mixed race women representing Britain's current understanding of itself? Does she signify, quote, a nation securing its own post-empire identity, <coughs> end quote, as one US commentator summed up the Olympic ceremony? Perhaps the Olympic celebration simply took its lead from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, whose commentary on the 2009 report on British ethnic and racial de demography proclaimed, quote, Britain is changing in a remarkable way. One in five of our children are from an ethnic minority background, and young people are six times more likely to be mixed race compared to adults. The old polarizing debate about black and white is changing, and the next generation will not see race in the same way we see it. This is hugely positive, and we can afford a moment to celebrate. Britain's diverse culture is becoming all the more fascinating and interconnected." End quote. This apparent embracing of mixedness seems, on the surface, a contrast to bygone times. When I was a little girl, being half caste as we were referred to then was not quite so cool. <laughs> I could not help wondering if there was something more to the celebration I was watching on my screen. Could it really be that in my lifetime, we women racialized as mixed have become symbols of Britain's racial progress? In this paper, I suggest that the answer that, to that question is unfortunately not. I wanted to consider the possibility that at one, one level may appear to be positive, may on another level actually be problematic. A great deal has been written about the impact of negative stereotypes, both in terms of how they affect persons associated with them and how others in turn come to view such persons. A less explored phenomenon is the negative impact of seemingly positive images. My claim here is that images of women racialized as mixed, now so publicly visible, mask deeper racisms that persist in British society today. Mixed race women's ascension from half caste mark to leading lady obscures the enduring impacts of structural inequality on the lives of racialized persons. In this regard, masking is a social phenomenon that has ethical and normative import. Masking left undetected or unchecked can affect the development and the outcomes of policy. In effect, masking disguises and conceals racism and sexism, and therefore negatively affects our ability to address these issues. To explore this claim, I discuss three ways that images of women racialized as mixed functions as masks in British society. Represent um, representational masquerade, cultural masquerade, and a feel-good masquerade. Those are the three sections of the paper. My aim here is to contrast the rosy picture of racial progress, the images of women racialized as mixed paint, and compare it with Britain's racial reality. Finally, I consider possible objections to this claim before concluding that notwithstanding the potential merits that can come from the public visibility of, of images of women racialized as mixed, there are more substantive changes that need to take place in, if Britain is to live up to its own ideals of being a nation where people are accepted, respected, and have the opportunity to thrive regardless of their race and gender. So section one will analyze the concept for a second. We are the mask. A mask is used to hide, conceal, or disguise the face, as one might in a masquerade ball. Indeed, the word dis derives from the old French mascara, and if for those of you who speak French, please correct me, um, <laughs> to masquerade, to black the face. The terms masking and masquerading are also used in the metaphorical sense. One wears a facial expression that conceals their true character, feelings, or intentions. Masking, however, is not an act that can only apply to persons. For example, I've had had occasionally had to mask the taste of certain vegetables my son doesn't currently like by mixing them with a sauce. In this case, in this sense, masking is to make the offending item imperceptible or indistinct. These conventional uses of masking or masquerading operate at the level of the individual. Even when it is not a person that is actually being masked, as in the case of my attempts to ensure my son eats healthily, making these examples Masking in these examples occur in and make reference to personal circumstances and experiences. The masking, and I'll use masking and masquerading interchangeably in this paper. Um, 
The masking I will discuss is not intended to refer to an individual instance when a white person masks their true feelings about a racialized person, for example, smiling when in being introduced to a racialized person at a staff training or a dinner party, while really feeling that that person has no right to be at said occasion. Rather, I use masking and masquerading to refer to a social political phenomenon. In this context, then, the masquerade I describe do not speak to the actions of any particular individual, but rather to the collective effect of numerous actions by numerous persons in multiple arenas. And while I do not seek to identify any particular individual who contributes to masking, I do aim to illuminate how racism as a social political phenomenon is masked such that it becomes imperceptible, obscured, and all covered up, and therefore problematic in British society. That is, the racism that seems relevant in British society is masked by pictures and images that show a bright, smiling, mixed-race woman as the symbol of the new Britain. The term masking, in referring to this collection of actions, is not, however, intended to suggest any kind of individual or collective intentionality. Masking, as I am using it, does not amount to some kind of substitute or intentional deception or conspiracy. Indeed, as I discuss at the end of the paper, the intent of persons who include women racialized as mixed in their advertising campaigns and various different cultural media might well be noble. They might actually understand themselves to be making a positive contribution to the advance of, of racial justice and racial harmony in Britain. So the connotation here does not su suggest any deliberate malevolence or malice. My aim in discussing masking is dis as disguising, obscuring, concealing and covering up is not accusation but observation. <coughs> That being said, there is an important clarification pertaining to intent and moral responsibility that is impacted by the relationship between the mask as an object, the person who uses the mask, and masking as an effect. In the conventional use of the term masking, the person who wears the mask is typically, typically covering their own face, identity, intentions, character, etc. The mask user makes an intentional choice to apply the mask or engage in this masquerade. In the masking, as I am using it here, the use of the mask might not only be unintentional, it is also remote from the mask user, such that the person whose action can be said to have produced the masking effect is not applying the mask to themselves but to another phenomenon, in this case racism in Britain. Further, as this suggests, it's not only that the mask is applied to something other than oneself, but rather that there is no mask to apply in the first place. The mask itself is produced insofar as it is understood to be the object that creates the ma masking masquerading effect. <coughs> this is crucial because it means that one cannot simply choose not to use an existing object that is readily identifiable as a mask to ensure one is not engaging in the kind of masking I'm talking about. Anything and anyone has the potential to become a mask if utilized in a problematic manner. Thus, in order to af avoid the effect of unintentionally masking racism, one has to first be aware of the racial reality of Britain as the context in which the mask might unwittingly be created, and second, engage in serious critical reflection of one's actions, applying due diligence to ensure one is not complicit in producing a mask that has the effect of masking racism. This requires a level of awareness and engagement with issues around racism not typically expected or understood as necessary in British society for meeting one's moral obligations to their fellow countrywoman. One further point in intention is concerned with who becomes the mask through this phenomenon of masking. <coughs> in the example I discuss in this presentation, women racialized as mixed become the mask that cover up and obscure racism in Britain. However, it's important, albeit a kind of obvious point, to note that in this sense, women racialized as mixed are not deliberately trying to contravene anti-racism efforts. As I shall discuss in the paper later, just as the presence of such bodies does not amount to a racial revolution, neither is their very existence tantamount to racial espionage. The point then is not to interrogate persons racialized as mixed on the basis of what their bodies look like, since they are not responsible for the body they were born with and without extensive cosmetic work cannot change whatever nature hand, whatever hand nature dealt them, but rather to interrogate the context, ideologies and processes that render these bodies masks in the first place. In this respect, we must keep in mind what part, the part of what constitutes the relevant context, ideologies and processes, in this case is Britain's colonial history. Racialized women have always served multiple functions in the British Empire, here we see wet nurse, slave, breeder, personal attendant, concubine, etc. 
through this whole historical frame, we can understand how, sorry, how today the bodies of women racialized as mixed, like their colonial counterparts, can be used to serve white patriarchal agendas in 21st century Britain. The intent here is not to suggest that the lives of racialized persons in Britain today are qualitatively comparable to their colonial counterparts, but rather to consider the possibility that the current public visibility of women racialized as mixed could be viewed as a legacy of British colonialism. Okay, so now I will get into these masquerades. The representational masquerade. The first masquerade suppose, supposes the image of women racialized as mixed can be used to represent any and all races in Britain. When young mixed race woman emerges from her multiracial household in the Olympic ceremony, it is this instance, is this the instance where she is quintessentially British? Or is this the moment that the EHRC encouraged us to take to celebrate the increase of persons racialized as mixed? Or was her role to make people racialized as black in Britain feel they too were part of the Olympic proceedings, not just in the role of athletes, but as acceptable, even celebrated part of British culture via their collective non-whiteness? Or were we to perceive her as an individual and not representative of any particular group, just a person who could have been anyone of any race? The representational masquerade would have us believe that we can answer to yes to all of these above questions. By implication, mixed race woman is someone who can represent anyone, everyone, and no one. And I just want to um, give a quick note on this slide. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with Rita Ora, but um, she, um, when questions about her racial, ethnicity, and origin, has um, rejected the idea that she's mixed race and claims to be 100% ethnic Albanian. She's originally from Albania. Um, however, most people perceive her to be mixed race. So if we accept her description of herself, she's actually not mixed race. But the imagery with Risa, or as we saw in the original slide, is kind of codified in these black tropes and these ethnic tropes. And so I just, I use the slide intentionally, not just so you know, I know that she's not um, self-identified as mixed race, but this is how these images can play on our understanding of race such that you can have a person who um, describes themselves as definitely not mixed race, uh, but rather white, but actually, like I say, gives the imagery um, of mixed race and again links itself to blackness, so um, just a note on that. Okay, so how is this deception possible? How is this represent um, representational deception possible? Contemporary mixed race identity from within and without has been constructed in a manner that facilitates the masquerade of representation. Mixed race identity has come to signify racelessness, post-race and individualism. Um, and you can see Naomi Zak, Suki Ali and um, Michelle Elam. The, the handout you had um, I'll, is just there so you can make reference to the different resources I'm calling on. It's only a selective kind of reading, it's, but um, I'll touch on some of the names on that list as I go through. Um, okay, I'm oh, sorry, you don't have it. Okay, you'll put it again. But that's not a bibliography in any way, I think. <laughs> okay, um, mixed race woman is not connected to any particular party and stands for no distinct I ideology, perhaps other than the doctrine of uniqueness. And we see here again this separation of identity from politics. Um, this is from mixed.org, uh, mixed which is an English mixed race organization that. Um, develops and sells parenting materials and how to help your mixed race child kind of educational um, um, packages and things like that. Um, she has no religious identity, although she is not necessarily understood to be offensively atheist. Similarly, mixed race woman seems to defy clear-cut class signifiers and has the added attraction of not being associated with any particular struggle or social problem. The problems of racial difference and racism have typically been represented through the imagery of black men and white women. Note the retranscription of this setup onto the Happy Olympic narrative. I don't know if you recall it, that um, the parents of our mixed race um, selfie um, were a black man and a white woman as opposed to the other way around. Um, and where the child these parents creates is no longer an unwelcome addition to the brown baby problem we saw of the post-war um, situation, but rather the promise of a happier future. Um, mixed race woman does not carry the racial baggage written onto the bodies of black men who are stereotyped as criminal, docile, stupid, a threat to society, hypersexualized, and absent fathers, absent and dysfunctional fathers. 
racialized as black or mixed. The latter group cannot do distance itself from black men and all the accompanying stereotypes as readily that's mixed race men I'm talking about here. Mixed race men are routine, uh, routinely referred to as black in the media. Um, familiar with these. Meanwhile, mixed race woman is also not the white norm and thus is unburdened by the structural power of the white man that might be offensive, might be off-putting to those looking to Britain for some post-colonial humility or a touch of cultural sensitivity. Nor does she embody the problematic narratives about race relations and sexism in Britain that are housed in the bodies of white and black women. White women, despite all the celebration of mixedness, still carry the historic stigma of race traitors, prostitutes, and of women of ill repute on account of their sexual interactions with black men. And if not sullied with racial stains, white women who read through, white women are read through the spectrum of controlling gender stereotypes Genteel, from genteel Victorian submissiveness at the one extreme um, to the unladylike bra burning feminists at the other. Mixed race woman has no ties to the feminist movement. Notice again in the Olympic ceremony, she is not at the forefront of the history lesson on the suffragettes, nor is she associated with the womanist movement, which, was, which does not feature in mainstream discourses in any case. Black women, if recognized at all, still labor under old worn stereotypes that characterize them as sexually licentious, aggressive and violent, unfit mothers, criminal or domineering and asexual. These stereotypes have not been sufficiently challenged or erased in Britain. In any case, manifestations of intersectional oppression are typically, typically excluded from discussions of racism or sexism. So women racialized as mixed, like those racialized as black, would typically be rendered invisible in such a discourse. Nevertheless, unfettered by social ills, the imagery implies mixed race woman is free to dance her merry dance across Britain. So can mixed race woman be someone to all persons in Britain? My claim is that she cannot. Let us first keep in mind Britain's racial demographics. As of the 2011 census, which includes obviously large waves of migration and asylum seekers from Africa and the Middle East that have occurred since the previous census, Britain is still 87.1% white. Of the remaining 12.9% that are classified as ethnic minorities, 3% are black and another two are mixed race. I should say here that I'm using the um, total UK census statistics. Um, that means including Scotland, Isles, um, England and Wales. Um, and so the numbers for the England and Wales, which is usually separate, are slightly different. So it's 86% white, the, the margin, and I think it's 2. 3% for mixed race, so they're, they're similar but close. Just to note also that um, the point I'm really making here is that mixed race people are obviously a tiny percentage of the population, so to call Jessica Ennis the face of the census is, just, is really just to raise um, that question. Um, the category for mixed race, I think in Scotland and Ireland, all the mixes are lumped together, so this 2% in terms of the British percentage is minorly inflated in a certain sense. Okay. Right, so, so as we can see from the graph, um, Britain is 87.1% white, 2% um, of those um, of the total population being mixed. Numbers aside, the notion that mixed race women represents everyone and anyone in Britain, and indeed that anyone and everyone could identify with her, represents a denial of the divisive effects of racializing and othering. While it is accepted that mixed race women can be British, she is still very much, as Brian opened the door for the conversation, very much other. The census and other political and social documents who use similar categorization systems, GP forms, job applications, we've all seen them, um, provide us with some clues about how some racialized groups come to be legitimately British and others do not. And here's just a cut of the census form. Um, as we can see, in the 2011 census, including in the options under the heading white, English, Scottish, Welsh, Northern Irish, British, Irish gypsies, travellers, an Irish traveller, and any other white background. Under the heading Black, African, Caribbean, Black, British, the options are African, Caribbean, and any other black. The British in Black, British eyes suggest here then signifies British Empire and its colonies rather than British as in the British Isles. Racialised persons in contemporary British society can be British insofar as they are understood to hail from the Commonwealth countries or the former colonies. A racialized person in Britain is not English or any of the other country designators because as the census shows us, to be English, Scottish, Wealth or Northern Irish is to be white. 
Interestingly too, there is a very limited framework for where black people might be from. What of all the racialized person? people racialized as black in Britain who come from Europe or South America, for example. And given the inclusion of Caribbean under the black heading, we can deduce that the UK census is not operating under a kind of Afrocentric approach to blackness, such that all black persons can be said to originate from Africa. And presumably the number of white South Africans resident in Britain are expected to tick any other white, since Africa only appears under the heading black. Note too that the mixes deemed relevant enough to categorize are those needed to identify when white has become compromised. The numerous other mixes that make up the British population, such as Caribbean and Asian mixes, for example, are of no concern and can therefore can be lumped in that one category. Conceptual and methodological contradictions in the census abound, but the material point here is that, racialized, is that to be racialized renders one something other than genuinely, authentically, legitimately English, Scottish, Welsh, or Northern Irish. The lived experiences of pe persons racialized as mixed tell a similar tale. The now cliched where are you from question remains a co common feature of our lives. A typical conversation might go something like this. Oh wow, I love your hair. Where are you from? <laughs> London. <coughs> yes, yes, uh, yes, I know, but where are you really from? <laughs> London. <coughs> okay, yes, but where are your parents from? The game can go on and on with different variations to the ending, depending on the mood and the politics and the perspective of the person racialized as mixed in this encounter. Even where the person racialized as mixed may never have traveled outside Britain, questions of the legitimacy of their Britishness remain written in their skin and hair. So do white, white people really see themselves reflected in mixed race women or identify with her as English like me, Scottish like me, Welsh like me, Northern Irish like me, or more importantly, a person like me? If she cannot represent all British people, can beautiful, unencumbered, thriving mixed race women at least represent other persons racialized as mixed? <coughs> as with all racialized groups, the diversity and complexity of the group is seldom acknowledged. If we, and I hear I put the group in square quotes because whether we can talk about the mixed race group at all, I think is highly problematic, but roll with me on this. <laughs> um, and although, in, and although in the case of persons racialized as mixed, at least mixed race women, the stylized depiction is intended as a flattering one, such narrow, simplistic narratives negate silence and render invisible the lived experiences of those excluded by the commercialized narrative. There is an emerging portion of the mixed race demographic who occupy higher social economic status and are better educated and have more social and cultural power than that previously associated with mixed race persons. Crucial intersections including class gen and gender further combine to generate very different lived experiences within the group racialized as mixed, however. Supposedly positive images then foster a skewed perspective that not only negates alternative narr narratives, they can also adversely affect public policy that gets developed in line with this masquerade. The implications for social outcomes come into sharp focus when we consider that a disproportionate number of persons racialized as mixed, from, particularly from low-income households, go through the care system in Britain, and that men racialized as mixed are pathologized and criminalized in much as the same fashion as men racialized as black, and are disproportionately represented in the juvenile delinquency and criminal justice systems. These represent two of the kind of obvious groups within the racialized as mixed demographic that are more likely to be subject to state interventions. While it is important to recognize the intersections of race, class, and gender, sexuality, etc., images of middle class mixed race women also function as a mask which renders issues of racism imperceptible or indistinct. This gives rise to another problematic narrative, namely the idea that racism is not a problem that the real issue here at play is class. While it is true that many of the life outcome measures are impacted by class, to fail to recognize racism as one of a number of intersectional variables that impact persons' life's chances is hugely problematic. Again, by extension of our understanding as race as a group, in the third representational masquerade, mixed race women is expected to do the work of expressing the voices, needs, and experiences of a profoundly di diverse group of people, people racialized as black. 
The profile of persons referred to as black in Britain has changed dramatically with various waves of immigration since the height of the politicized black, with a capital B, identity politics of the 1980s. As with generations of personalized, racialized as black now born in Britain, it would be dangerous to assume that these diverse peoples necessarily have a shared history, culture, or set of experiences in Britain or abroad, such that one catch-all label could facilitate meaningful public policy. Indeed, we can readily question whether the idea of blackness around such which persons might form a common identity, and that's, that's within people who might be racialized in that way. Um, we'll probably going to speak on that later, so we will here. The further concern with this version of the masquerade is whether persons racialized as black are comfortable with their bodies, needs, and perspective and lived experience being represented by a person racialized as mixed, and indeed whether persons racialized as mixed are comfortable with carrying that mantle. The question of whether a Persian can and should be considered a spokesperson for the wider black community is of course rife with problems even if a person racialized as black is that um, leadership figure. <coughs> have they garnered a consensus from the, from the community? Do they actually have meaningful ties and engagement with that community such that they might be considered representative of the group? When they speak, do they see themselves speaking for the group? These questions assume further import when applied to representatives racialized as mixed, given the non-political bent of such persons. Take, for example, Adam Afriye, the first black member of parliament. Oh, I should have a slide for this. I don't know where it's gone. Oh, I've got the wrong way around, sorry. Just so you can get a visual. Right. Yes, Adam Afriye was identified as the first black, black member of parliament for the Conservative Party who does not accept this racial description. I consider myself post-racial, he declares. I don't see myself as a black man. I refuse to be defined by my color and pigeonholed in that way, end quote. Persons racialized as mixed often have a very individualistic philosophy. Many are not comfortable with racial labels at all. And the media surrounding persons racialized as mixed, the subject of race is often avoided, omitted, downplayed, or given minimal attention. Furthermore, mixed race privilege and the lack of trust between persons racialized as black and persons racialized as mixed may suggest um, any claim to wider group representation is highly problematic. These are not minor issues that can be glossed over simply because all racialized persons might be said to have a common enemy, white supremacy, or because we can all trace our roots back to Africa. So if a mixed race person, woman, can't re represent a group, can she just be herself? The final representational masquerade suggests that racialized persons, both mixed and monoracial, can function in British society as individuals, unencumbered by their race, gender, social status, history, culture, etc. The masquerade here is the vigorous individualism of our liberal democracy, is the idea that this individual, individualism sorry, can be enjoyed by all persons. This illusion, similar to the first representational masquerade, proclaims a racialized person is not othered, that the very process of being raced and gendered has no impact on a person's identity, either in terms of how they see themselves or with respect to how they are viewed and treated by others. It is a claim to which many persons racialized as mixed have subscribed, but one that remains unsubstantiated by empirical evidence and rigorously refuted theoretically by critical race theorists particularly with respect to the legal implications. And here I'm just going to point to a couple of names on your hand. Um, oh, you haven't got the handout, so you, you will see it. Um, Delgado is the French, um, Kimberly Crenshaw is another, obviously, um, working in the legal field. This claim has also been robustly refuted by feminist philosophers and social scientists who have taken issue with the possibility of epistemological, political, and or moral objectivity presumed by liberalism and the failure to acknowledge the myriad ways in which physical embodiment necessarily impacts how we are perceived by others and ourselves. Sorry, you should never use a slideshow, it always creates problems. Right. Okay, so the second masquerade, the cultural masquerade. For any of the masking I suggest that takes place, the cultural masquerade gets to the heart of what is problematic. It operates such that the supposed advancement of cultural representation of women racialized as mixed 
attest to some kind of equivalent process in the battle to dismantle deeper forms of structural racism in Britain. In this respect, the achievements of the few conceal the marginalization of the many. Insofar as mixed race women is characterized as free, transcendent, unbound by social baggage, one of the most powerful messages she implicitly sends is that structural power dynamics play no role or at best an insignificant role in reproducing racial and gender inequalities in Britain. She lacks social or historical context. We never trace her history further back than her two parents. The closest we get to a discussion of the relevance of political, economic or social structures in her life are stories of her being bullied at school because she is mixed and doesn't fit in. She's an example of one of these. No matter how painful such experiences are, or how confused about not fitting in little mixed race girl is, she invariably overcomes these personal setbacks and becomes the mixed race woman we are also familiar with. As Elam observes, quote, mixed race is a category, gains the most political presence and impact when it appears to validate the most cherished and powerful mores, values and traditions of the national credo, end quote. Success, successful mixed race woman underpins Britain's cherished credo of tolerance and fairness. Okay, and I'm going to give the disclaimer like everyone else. These statistics are just a snapshot. They're not. Um, I'm not pretending they're a comprehensive picture, and I understand the problems with representational <coughs> percentages, etc., etc. So I hope you'll um, take that as a given. Um, this cultural masquerade, then, like the representational masquerade, is multi-layered. The first myth is that the visual representation in popular culture reflect holders. Um, sorry, that the visual representation in popular culture reflects holders of structural power. That her presence on the billboard speaks to her presence in the boardroom. Images of women racialized as mixed provide a concrete reference for people who can claim things are not like they used to be in subscribing to the masquerade. These images of success mislead people to believe that such individual achievements either necessarily translate into meaningful structural shifts in the power base of a given industry or society as a whole, or that persons in power have for some inexplicable reason changed their attitude and behaviours with respect to race and gender. Unfortunately, again, the evidence does not support this view and I'm taking, like I say, that as a snapshot. A second myth of the cultural masquerade is that familiarity and acceptance of images of women racialized as mixed is a meaningful proxy for the kind of interaction, collaboration and commitment between persons of all races required for positive structural change. This is where the masquerade of mixed race women really comes into its own. The idea that interracial sex and the children it sometimes produces speaks to a disruption of the status quo, has been repeated so often in so many guises it has become something of a mixed race mantra. Intermix.org believe that, quote, acknowledging and celebrating the achievements of mixed race individuals and their families, past and present, will re-educate society with the objective of ensuring the 21st century will not see the mixed race experience as an issue, but as a positive contribution towards a more harmonious society, end quote. Mainstream media has also jumped on recent versions of this bandwagon, championing interracial sex as iconically British and cause for the nation to congratulate itself. Example of this was the BBC's three-part documentary, Mixed Britannia. It fervently promoted the supposed revolutionary powers of interracial sex. In closing, George Anagaya, himself in a mixed-race relationship, carried the current captured the current attempt to portray Britain's attitude towards itself, towards race, as laudable. Quote, this is the summation at the end of the documentary. He invites us to take a look at them. They're British, every one of them. Their story is also the story of modern Britain. We've seen how in this country's, we've seen how this country's been exposed to the same poisonous mix of racist theory and prejudices as the rest of Europe and America. Through it all, we've cut a, cut a rather unique path. Trade and empire had a part to play. Personal courage was matched by a sort of communal pragmatism. And then, of course, there was love and lust. <laughs> what, whatever the reasons, Britain has emerged as one of the most mixed nations on earth, and I, for one, am proud of that." Close quote. 
quite how the mere presence of persons racialized as mixed, or even the recognition and celebration of their presence, will lead to a more harmonious society is never really explained. The historical picture certainly doesn't bode well for interracial sex being an effective tool for bringing an end to structural racism and sexism, either at home or in the for former colonies. As Naomi Zack notes, quote, the shifting racial ta taxonomies have not reflected changes in scientific consensus about race, but have expressed political power, social attitudes, and economic interests, close quote. The source of the current optimism about the power of interracial sex and those born of it seems to be a mystery. What is it this unique power to inspire justice the bodies of persons racialized as mixed are supposedly endowed with? Will a person socialized in a world of racial hierarchy, a hierarchy that positions them favorably, be so deeply moved as to undertake the challenge and commitment of dismantling white supremacy and patriarchy just because they know that someone else had interracial sex? Will racialized persons come to think that white people actually respect and value them after all, and suddenly become empowered and equipped to shape this country to the core, risking the well-known repercussions to challenging white supremacy and patriarchy just because a white person slept with a person racialized as black? Indeed, are these interracial sexual unions revolutionary to anyone in Britain? Don't most of us today know that people have been having sex across the so-called races all along? The reality is, reality is, a white person being willing to marry a racialized person or to have a child with one, even in the most loving circumstances, tells us little about whether that white person will, for example, example hire a racialized person that they've never met, lived to, or had sex with, challenge subtle or blatant forms of racial aggression on behalf of racialized persons, even when their sexual partner is not in the room, write robust legislation that facilitates the enforcement of racial justice, articulate a more honest and accurate narrative about British history, be confident enough in their own identity to interrogate the elements of that identity which are founded on the idea that racialized persons are inferior, for example, the notion of Englishness. The concern, again, is the implications for public policy here. While important social changes have taken place in Britain over the last 50 years with respect to people's attitudes about race, the cultural successes of mixed race women suggest we don't need to be political anymore. However, persons racialized as mixed like their black counterparts are not regarded as equally valuable in Britain, and the old stereotypes endure powerfully below the surface. And here's an example of one of them. This was a documentary done by Channel 4, Mel, the trace Mel B back to her voodoo origins. Um, even when it appears to indicate respect and value, cultural recognition is fleeting especially in these times of instant celebrities. It cannot therefore serve as a reliable indicator or substitute for social and political reform. The last masquerade, the feel-good masquerade. This operates such that positive images of women racialized as mixed should necessarily be viewed with a pos in a positive light, that we should indeed feel good about them. This imperative to feel good about such images in our society makes the discomfort white persons feel and the pain, frustration, disappointment and betrayal racialized persons experience as a result of British racism. We want to believe that somehow mixed race women's face at the Olympics representing her country on billboards and the charts and the red carpet means we can stop talking about or stop feeling guilty about the fact that we're not talking about racism and sexism. The idea that we don't have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with these monolithic, impenetrable institutions because somehow, miraculously, things are different now is a welcome message, particularly, particularly in these times of political disillusionment and apathy. However, buying into this masquerade requires us to ignore the fact that the very idea of images, identities, and ideologies can be layered on top of the bodies of women racialized as mixed as if these bodies are not real people who have their own agency, experiences, and perspectives is profoundly problematic. This masquerade can only function effectively if, in creating the image of mixed race women, we strip women racialized as mixed of their complexities, sense of self, and ultimately their humanity, only to repackage what's left simplified, objectified, and free of social baggage. The allure of mixed race women is that she makes us feel good, Unburdened by life, she is thriving in a way that most of us can only dream of. 
Moreover, the image of mixed race women is unique in its ability to achieve the precarious balancing act of managing to appear to have it all and yet not connote privilege in the way that it inspires envy and resentment. She is beautiful, desirable, talented, successful, carefree and independent. Who wouldn't want to be her? Her looks are the result of providence or genetic fortune, depending on your worldview. Her talents, we are led to presume, are gifts, but ones that she has worked hard to cultivate. These gifts, in some cases, may be perceived as a function of her racial origins, so singing, dancing, playing sportics, for example. But more often, they are varied enough that she eludes ready presumptions that she has some essentialized innate capacity for certain activities. And while it is clear she is not economically challenged, she has not grown up with the proverbial silver spoon in her mouth. She may often be well educated, um, but she doesn't connote the kind of elitism and stuffy and snobbishness of British boarding schools. On account of her multifarious heritage, mixed race woman has a kind of cultural fluidity that permits her to traverse the globe. The cele celebrities mentioned, as you saw in the slide before, um, all travellers are a result of their work. Her ethnic heritage also suggests that she has meaningful ties to exotic lands, and incidentally the means to travel to such faraway places, though not in the somewhat creepy Great White Hope kind of way that harks back to missionary enterprise is so common nowadays. Mixed race woman does not have to pack her bags under the guise of adopting a helpless African child, or saving the entire continent from poverty, which for most people are unrealistic and indeed undesirable goals if all you want to do is get some sun. Mixed race woman might simply be visiting her relatives. Whatever mixed race woman's motive, as in the case with any good advertising, her image captures a lifestyle many yearn for while simultaneously giving the appearance of attainability. With mixed race woman, we believe the dream is reachable. Yet my concern here is not with the menu of lifestyle options mixed race woman represents. In likening the public visibility of a particular characterization of women racialized as mixed to advertising, the intent is not to feign naivety about how advertising is designed to work um, on all people regardless of their race. That being said, I am suspicious of the mixed race visual utopia because as Elam rightly observes, quote, a good deal of mixed race advocacy remains indebted to precisely the visual fetishes and spectacular epistemologies of race that proponents claim to overthrow, in part because they never quite address the cultural construction of seeing itself, end quote. I am wary of the current tendency to recreate mixed race women without reference to her historical cultural construction and current social political context. In this sense, the dream that is being sold is not a lifestyle but a particular characterization of British society. Images of prospering mixed race women, I suggest, make us feel good because they reify and reinforce Britain's moral self image. One way we might understand the force and impact of the feel-good masquerade is through the just world theory pioneered by social psychologist Melvin Lerner. The basic idea here is that most people believe in a just world. Consequently, when people are confronted with stories of other people whose suffering is not of their own making, this threatens their belief in the just world and causes psychological discomfort. Psychological research has found that to soothe this discomfort rather than relinquish their belief in the just world, People blame the victim as a way to rationalize undeserved human suffering. The effects of racism and sexism in Britain run counter to our belief in a just world. As such, the images of successful mixed race women are a welcome balm that allows us to restore our faith in the basic fairness of British society. Positive images of a person who is both racialized and gendered support the idea that Britain's racial relations and gender differentials have radically progressed. They supposedly bear witness to the enduring legacy of British tolerance, proving that unlike less morally and socially evolved nations, we have come to live the liberal idea of a democratic, pluralistic meritocracy. In short, the masquerade presides a source of British pride. At this particular moment in British history, the importance of this should not be underestimated. <coughs> The masquerade also silences the voices of those wishing to challenge racial and gender, the racial and gendered status quo. Those who do persist are perceived in a problematic light. They have the proverbial chip on their shoulder. They are ungrateful for all Britain has given them. They are old-fashioned in their thinking. Identity politics is dead, politics is dead, it's so 1980s. Or worse, they are self-serving opportunists. The prevailing characterization of the so-called riots of 2011 are exemplary in this regard. 
Prime Minister David Cameron issued a speech in response to the riots where he proclaimed, quote, these riots were not about race. The perpetrators and the victims were white, black, and Asian. These riots were not about government cuts. They were directed uh, at, high streets, at high street stores and not at parliament. And these riots were not about poverty. That insults the millions of people who, whatever their hardship, would never dream of making others suffer like this. No, this was about behavior. People showing indifference to right and wrong. People with twisted moral code. People with a complete absence of self-restraint. Close quote. Contrary to Mr. Cameron's and indeed the wider media's characterization of the young people who protested up and down the country, these <coughs> discounted social, political, and economic factors were precisely why people of all ages took to the streets. And what you're seeing here on this um, slide in front of you, um, the columns in the maroon color are the respondents, the, the people who participated in the riots, their response to which of these variables um, motivated them to participate. And the columns in green are the perspectives of the kind of media and the general population as to what the motives um, for the rioters were. And so you can see in that, and these are ranked in order, so there are 15 um, going down the columns um, they're ranked in that way. So poverty is number one, policing was number two in terms of the order of importance um, as to why people uh, participated. So um, those factors most widely perceived as the causes by the general public, gangs, poor parenting, criminality, moral decline, interestingly, were those least cited by the protesters themselves. My contention is that the feel-good masquerade projects a misguided picture of race relations and the racial climate in Britain, which facilitates a tendency to blame and pathologize the individual and his or her parents for social problems, rather than attribute undesirable social outcomes to deeper structural factors. Again, the psychology is quite straightforward. Laying the blame at the individual level frees us of the collective responsibility of our nation's challenges. Thus we can escape, or at least to pretend to escape, from the fallout when, as Malcolm X once said, the chickens come home to roost. This silencing has, also has a more insidious function of framing how racialized persons perceive their own context vis-a-vis -vis racism, such that they too buy into the skewed vision of Britain's racial progress. Indeed, one of the core functions of the feel-good masquerade is to depoliticize race, racism and sexism rendering them personal challenges rather than that social and or political concerns. <coughs> As with the cultural and representational masquerades, the field of masquerade distorts and conceals the reality of racism, making it difficult for racialized persons to identify and articulate structural forms of racial and gender oppression. This in turn makes it difficult to hold the appropriate agencies accountable for addressing those challenges. For example, despite the fact that the primary factors cited as motivators for protesters, and that's our first column, um, poverty, policing, government policy, unemployment, and the shooting of Mark Duggan, are all deeply raced in British society. Only 54% of persons attributed racial tension as a motivating factor for their actions. So how is this um, perceptual disconnect between the social reality and the social myth possible for both white and racialized persons? More worryingly, if race is not understood as at least an intervening factor in these major social problems, what are our policy strategies for addressing poverty and unemployment policing going to look like? Will we begin, will we be having this same conversation in the aftermath of another episode of riots in Br as British history suggests we may well be? Perhaps the most disturbing characteristic of the feel-good masquerade is that it is self-perpetuating. In the context of the just world effect, seemingly positive mixed-race women gives rise to a set of attitudes that reinforce our denial of racism and sexism in Britain. With dissenting voices silenced or pathologized, national pride riding high, and the race and gender-based inequalities in British society placed firmly within the, with the individual, everyone can go home feeling good in the knowledge that they have done their moral duty. We can all get over it. So, isn't positive just positive? Perhaps we should be less cynical here. There are many people who do recognize racism and sexism should still be on the social agenda, social and political agenda. In itself, a reason to consider four possible objections to my argument that seemingly positive images of women racialized as mixed actually mask the structural racism and sexism. 
and thus compromise the journey towards a fairer Britain. First, one might argue that such images foster racial harmony. As we have seen, attitudes towards people, attitudes toward people of different backgrounds have softened in Britain, and surely the presence of racialized persons in the media have played a part in shaping those attitudes. <coughs> Second, images of racialized people challenging the hegemony of white as the only legitimate British identity. Third, images of positive mixed race women serve as important role models, which are desperately needed to counteract the predominantly negative depiction of racialized persons in the media. And fourth, such images can be a valuable source of hope to other women racialized as mixed, especially young women, about what they can achieve. This sense of hope is an important psychological weapon against the often demoralizing effects of racism and sexism. I can readily accept all of the above objections and what I am proposing still stands. My claim does not in any way refute or reject these as very important benefits the public visibility of positive mixed race women may con contribute to anti-racism and anti-sexism efforts in Britain. To be clear, my contention is not that we should remove or reduce the public visibility of po positive images of women racialized as mixed or indeed of any other racialized person. I agree that along with the four possible objections, there are many additional reasons we need greater positive public vi visibility and increased representation of women racialized as mixed as all other racialized persons. The claim here is that a great deal more work needs to be done before we can rest assured that such images do not also have the negative effect of masking social injustices as I am proposing that they do. If positive images of women racialized as mixed are to avoid having the negative effects of operating as representational, cultural and feel-good masquerades, we need to take more radical action that helps to identify and eradicate the deeply entrenched racisms and sexisms that permeate our social, political and cultural structures. Indeed, the key word here is action. Presence without practice is a hollow victory. For even as we have noted the talented female celebrities who are the mixed race face of British culture, that same list must serve as a, notion of, as a note of caution. For mixed race women is not the face of structural or institutional power in any domain of British society. She is not the face of British politics, nor is she the face of Britain's influential financial and legal systems. She is not the face of science and technology. She is not the face of business and industry, and she is not the face of academia. Gabriella, I think that was a, a, a brilliant sort of essay on the rhetoric of entities. Um, fascinating. Because time is at a premium, can I do two things? First of all, ask people to keep their contributions very brief so as to allow as many people as possible to uh, comment or question. And secondly, can we take maybe three or four at a time? Yes, because we're yeah. sort of running yeah. late. Amina? Uh, well, Amina first. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe we have a question from Edinburgh. I just want to ask you uh, about whether Edinburgh has been the meaning of how the Australian students are perceived by ages. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Um, I wanted it to two comments. Could you to introduce yourself briefly? Sorry, who you are. Oh, sorry, Deirdre Osborne okay. Goldsmiths. Um, I wondered at the idea of masking in the UK versus passing in the US, and the idea that in the environments of enslavement where rape and coercive sex set the terms for mixedness, whereas in the UK there was more of a history of consensual relations, how you might work with those two terms. Give me one second, let me write that down one second. I'm asking compared to two points. Um, so yeah. mm -hmm. I was wondering at what point do are these women determined to be um, mixed and therefore positive images? Because now we're looking at the choices of mixed children in the school, they're not, they're not called as mixed, they're thinking of black and you know, because it, often, because it doesn't necessarily happen at home because you know there are issues like at home whether you're to be black or white 
Um, so I just wondered at what point you thought women became seen as mixed, because it doesn't necessarily have its own, it doesn't necessarily have its own. One last, yeah. Hi, thanks. I'm Kurt Brown from um, Birkbeck. Um, great paper. Um, I thought, yeah, in terms of this positioning of mixed women as this kind of um, evidence for dissolving racial hierarchies, I thought was fantastic. Um, just to keep the question short, um, I just wanted to ask at one point as well, you mentioned how there was this. Um, there was this assumption that English, Scottish, Irish and Welsh equal white, whilst British <coughs> allows for a performance of a British identity by these mixed people. Um, obviously one is lacking, but it's because the civic identity can be evidenced by passports or you know, citizenship. Um, in relation to that, as we now face the point in which the British state may, perpetual, may possibly fragment, I mean, haven't we had this um, election coming up here in Scotland? Anyone knows whilst it may not be successful this time, these independence questions, once they reach this level, tend not to disappear. In light of that, what do you think the ramifications or consequences for those women that you mentioned would be in a new um, reconfigured idea of Britain or even English? Okay. Sorry, I'm um, <laughs> Okay, so the, to the question about um, Asian women. Firstly, um, I'm not very familiar actually to, about the intersection of how Asian women are treated in the literature um, with respect to mixed race. Um, there, I, sh I should say, in specifically in response to what do Asian people think of it, that's not my area of research, so I don't want to pretend um, that I um, know about that. However, I think that my analysis is not was not intended um, to narrow the question, I, I intentionally chose the black and white mix from in the images that I use, but I think the phenomenon of masking I'm talking about is way broader than that, and I think women, Asian women in particular included in that, as are Latino women, um, as any woman I think who's othered, but who floats in this kind of racially ambiguous landscape, I think is really what's at work here. And so my intention, like I say, is not to narrow it down to the black-white mix. And so in that respect, then there are, there's a, a huge body of work discussing those questions. So Linda Olkoff and people like this um, raise these questions. And, and I think what's at the heart of it, again, is, is this process of othering. It's about who gets to be legitimately British. And, and kind of turning to your question, I want to answer them almost a little bit at the same time. It's about how do we perceive persons of colour and are they legitimately English or white and what does that say about these hierarchies and these images. And so for me the way mixed race women is used, as I think are Asian women often and, and like I say anyone else who fits this racially I don't even want to say ambiguous because there's a lot of work that talks about well what of mixed race people who aren't racially ambiguous? What of those people who you can readily identify as black or any of the other racial categories? And, and how do we talk about them? But for me, the question is, um, how does that impact on our perception of this race problem? And it's really for us to interrogate these images in whatever form they come. So, so do you see what I mean? I'm just taking this as just one example for me. There are many other images that we can look at and ask these same questions and ask, is this kind of almost fetish for talking about proportions I think that came up earlier is it are these really just conversations that silence these discussions and render certain questions um, you know not legitimate to ask in these um, contexts and so I want to tie um, your question about the devolution and how does this connect um, I think always that as we, a number of panelists have spoke of, um, spoken of today, the race and racism and what race labels include, I've got kind of like Robert's um, definition, is that they're shifting boundaries all the time. And so the devolution of Scotland and Ireland and the separating off from, and the British Isles, you know, coming under these different names, if that's politically what transpires, I think creates an opening where perhaps identities can be re- um, transcribed and these boundaries can be pushed and shifted but I think as with 
whether you're calling it British or English or any of the other names in which people identify themselves with, the real work is about how we understand each other and that if the hierarchy that presumes a person of colour is inferior to a person who's white, whether you call them English or British is not so much the point. Mm -hmm. It's this question of how do we manage these differences and what do these images convey. So I, if you see on my last slide, I intentionally didn't put faces on that one because when we see these images of these, of the halls of power, what do we automatically think of? So if I call myself English, if I'm not seen that way and I'm not treated that way as that being a legit legitimate ent identity for me, it's not that it doesn't matter that I call myself that, but that's for me what generates the question and what generates the work that we need to engage in to change that. So does that answer? Right, so we had, um, next? okay, so I'm gonna go to you next because it kind of ties in with this question um, about mixed and when do you become mixed. Um, I think as always, one of the things that's tricky when we talk about race and racism is this question of the power of self-identification and that juxtaposed to you being othered by external political social factors. And one of the concerns I have in the mixed race dialogue oftentimes is that there's an expectation that if I declare myself to be something, so it shall be without reference to how I'm othered by other people and without reference to how I'm actually treated. And so I think yours was a great question about when do we become mixed race? Um, and I'm, I'm trying to think, go through the different, of the different kind of celebrities that I had up, up, up on the slides. They've answered the question in different ways. So some have rejected the idea of mixed race Zadie Smith, for example, in her books, doesn't like to talk about race. I think her book, NW, she's intentionally written without um, including, I think it's black, um, references in the book so that you read it and the race of the person becomes identifiable through their language and the discourse around it. She intentionally kind of rejects the idea that you say, the black man walked in the room, you know, that kind of language that you see in literature. So I think how and who identifies is relevant not only in what you say about yourself but my concern is really is how does the state force and coerce you into doing into being one thing or another so if we talk about what you, you said well mixed race people are, are often seen as black in some respects and one of the examples i gave in the care system there's a obviously endless literature around that question because mixed race people and children are treated as black and therefore can't be adopted by white families or not can't be, but the kind of policy guidance is about, you know, matching them with racially appropriate parents and they languish in the care system. And so that mixed race person can proclaim themselves to be whatever they want is, what are the impacts of these policies? So, so I don't want to pretend that there is an agency in how we name ourselves and how we present ourselves in the world, but I think that always has to be interrogated against these larger structures. I just want to say, it's, it's slightly problematic. It's obviously the ideal, you know, to be from the kind of women, you know, yet we have at the point where children aren't, you know, the identity thing, what are you? Yes. So like black or white. Yes. And then at one point, it's like, well, how do you get to this isolated position where people sometimes don't want to own it? Because you want to be seen as black, so you tell them that I'm black, and I understand perhaps what that culture is. And I still tell them that I can't be white. But if you look at me and say, Claire Farmer's mixture, she's a woman who's a woman. What does mixture actually mean? And how do I become that if I want to become that? But it actually, that's what I was supposed to ask. Let me get to um, the question. that are available in the UK and the US are yeah. nuanced and, and separate in many ways, although the oppressions can be remarkably similar. And I just thought, given you've worked in both contexts and you're developing a conceptualisation, I think, from yeah. here, what you might use um, or discard in, in those two terms as they relate to each other. Right. Well, 
this is a really good question because I've just been thinking about this lately actually, is this question of the ambiguous of mixed race, the ambiguousness of mixed race identities or of mixed race appearance, is that a lot of the mixed race um, kind of, or, or those who are proponents and want to kind of celebrate this mixed race history and have mixed race studies as a separate discourse and, you know, keep wanting to separate it away from larger discussions on race, rely on the idea that mixed race people necessarily can pass, you know, and, and that you can't be placed within the framework of existing racial categories, when that just simply isn't the case for a lot of mixed race people. They are readily identified as connected to the, you know, their, their race to ethnic background, if you like. And so the question of passing then, I think, um, really applies to a small, in, in kind of statistical terms, and even in the American context, I like a really minute actual percentage of the, po of the population. The question for me with passing is really about, well, what does it say about the context we're in? Why is this passing narrative why does it carry weight in the American context, for example? Why do we still care about it? Um, how come you still get passing narratives even though the practice really isn't relevant in post, you know, post-civil rights society? You still you get books like The Human Stain, etc. You know, and so for me, um, I how I choose to look at mixed race is to see it as part of this broader context of um, discussions and discourse and dialogue about race and. And as Brian was talking about, look for the analogies and can compare and contrast and see how we can be informed by that. So for me, the masking in contrast with um, passing is really about what does it say about the racial reality that we're dealing with. That passing is still an attractive idea or still an idea that carries weight, tells us something about that context just as the you know wonderful happy free mixed race woman tells us something about this context so for me they're always mutually informative in that way <coughs> we're way over time but let's just have one love one more round and please try and keep it brief as quickly as possible so then you then you somebody over there you <laughs> okay so who was first? Okay, I'll try and be brief. Try and be brief. Bear with me. First, I'll, two observations and a question. Two really first, I detest the word mixed race because it implies a pure race. And it's such a divisive expression because you're using the dialogue of them to describe us. You know, them and us. So I, I detest mixed race. Point, the, first, the second point, Olympics. I was at the Olympics. I was a games maker. I worked in the Olympics. The Olympics was the first time. This is anecdotal, but I was the... That was a unifying thing amongst me and many of my black friends. That was a great time to be black. Many of my friends went out and bought Great Britain t-shirts for the first time. Yeah. And I've been to I've been to conferences about that, and there was a there was a positivity that came from from uh, Ennis and Mo. So so I, I I'm, I'm sorry I, I was I, I refused that, that that opening slide. And then my last point my last point is this. I found that a very, I'm sorry for this, a very depressing, a very, very realistic, but very depressing review of the, set of, of the situation. And I work with girls, girls and boys like that. So what hope, what vision do you give them for their part in British society today? Okay, can you remember please to introduce yourself? Who was that for a second? Your name? Oh, okay. Okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Did you introduce yourself? No, no. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, Rashmita Chiromuto from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, very quickly on the last slide. So in the US, there is a face to the halls of power who comes from a different heritage, but he's typically racialized as black. I wondered if you had any comment on that. What's that? In the US, yeah. there is a face on the halls of power who is from mixed heritage, but he's typically racialized as black. I wondered if you had any comment about what that signifies. Who was third? That's all right. No, 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 I, I didn't know who they were asking the name for. Yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to pick up on your point you made about there being distrust between those racialized as mixed race and those racialized as black. 
think you can do perhaps expand the ways in which this is just places so The next person was Tamar. I'm, I'm Tamar. I'm working at uh, All Smart AEP, which is a reservation for the representation of um, Black British presence um, in the UK. Um, and my question is regarding uh, skin and sort of albino um, aesthetics and whether or not you see if that's a completely different um, conversation to albinos or if whether or not that you see that's a link or that's a how you sort of um, mainly coming from the image you had of um, mixed race women. I was thinking of in particular as a albino model at the moment called Sean Ross who's been um, much larger as being sort of the face of um, similar kind of you know ambiguity and that kind of thing and whether or not you can have some um in the next year. Okay. Gentlemen at the back. Um I, I agree with you in the sense of the use of the term mixed race. I don't like it myself at all. I used it for expediency um, and because it's a relevant term that's, u it's a term that's used in this context. But I think precisely um, one of the purposes of this conference really is to what, what can philosophy do? For me, this is one of the things philosophy can do is to interrogate these terms and to come to, to rethink these definitions, these labels, and critique them and show why they're problematic. So I don't, like I say, I don't, I don't disagree with you um, in that respect <coughs> whatsoever. And again, and again likewise, um, as I said, my intent, I'm sorry if I depressed you, but my intent was not to suggest that there aren't multiple positive outcomes from events like the Olympics and our participation in them. That's really not the intent at all, but rather that to suggest that even when things look good, we still need to be engaged in this continual process of interrogation because unless we are to assume that the struggle is over. And, and the, the words I would offer of hope is that as we do this work in philosophy and other disciplines, we just gradually build our arsenal of tools for ways we can counteract, we can engage in the anti-racism, anti-sexism efforts. It's the more we think about these issues, the more we can deconstruct the images that we're bombarded with, the better equipped we are to challenge power uh, within our different spheres of influence, the, um, the better um, we are at identifying when we are the victims of racial prejudice or when it's just a happenstance, the, the more acutely we um, kind of refine our tools, the better place we are in the future. And so. What my intent and what my hope is, is not to, to depress you, but to um, begin this conversation of, you know, cr critique and, um, and and heightening awareness, if you like. So, so my kind of words of hope to the mixed race person would be today is know your history, because we have come a long way from where we once were. As we looked at the historical slide, you know, we are no longer you know, mammies and breeders and concubines, etc. However, that doesn't mean that the struggle is over. And for me, we can each do our little piece, you know, to chip away at these halls of powers to shift um, the landscape so that we get to our ideal point where we are genuinely equal. So, like I, say, I hope I haven't depressed you, but that. Um, okay, so where am I next? Um, so you, yes, you were to, um, the lady's question next to you about the face of power in the US, and it, was it just my thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting that like um, in the US there isn't much talk about mixed race at all, um, right? Other well, than I, passing, maybe, and and just it seems to me that the dominant feeling is well, just having that face uh, on the halls of power hasn't meant anything to the actual lives of people into the struggle. So even if you do get faces in more places. Yeah, yeah what, what does it say? Well, yeah. I think the first point of reference is the historical, um, yeah, sure. is the historical context. The US, yeah. unlike, um, well, Britain, unlike the US, didn't have the rule of hyper, yeah, exactly. hyper yeah, hyper codified yeah. Um, into yeah. the language, into the law, into right. the social practices in the same way. And so there was actually, I remember when Obama got elected, yeah. and there were a number of articles over here of um, 
from mixed race people kind of outraged at why isn't he being called mixed right. why do they keep referring to him as black and off you know and I, I think I had recently come back to London at that time and I was like oh, you just need to go to America and understand <laughs> like the, the um, perception of race and how race has been codified is different so I think that history of how the terms are used and what terms have become prevalent is why you get that different use of language and, and different referent. Um, and I think in, in the British context, there hasn't been the same, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm not a historian, so I don't want to get myself in hot water, but I don't think that there's been the same kind of, what word do I want to use, um, pr pretense that this race mixing doesn't go on. It, it's mm. been recognised, like, like I say, there are, there are yeah. terms, you know, like a half caste mulatto, etc. They've all been part of the British popular imagination. There hasn't been the same kind of polarisation in that way. And yet, we still have these racisms that pervade along these racial barriers. And for me, that's almost the comparison between America and, England, uh, and Britain is interesting for that reason. Mm. How is it that we get these different uses of language, different codes different practices and still come up with the, the same effects you know or, or similar effects and more as well yes more yes yeah. okay um yeah trust um between mixed race people and black people um okay so i think and i don't know whether to you i, I can use anecdotes um i think that there is a suspicion that black people have of persons who are racialized as mixed. Um, and, and we talked a lot today about perceptions and, and these kind of things. In some cases it's earned, in some cases it's not. But I think that the connection to white people, whether it's directly through one's parents or through the kind of ideologies and um, commitments that mixed race persons themselves express, that there is this and I'm, again, I don't want to generalise and say all black people have it, or that all mixed race peace, mixed race people have earned, you know, this lack of trust. But I, I think it's a, it's a question that hasn't been discussed enough. And if we're talking about unity, I think oftentimes these categories, one of the things that's problematic about them is that they collapse everyone into a race label that assumes we all think alike, assumes that we all have similar experiences assumes that we all have the same perspective on any range of number of topics and that just simply isn't the case and when i had the slide up of the different faces that could be called black in britain you know we can't assume that the needs and the perspectives of the recent immigrant who maybe doesn't speak the language or you know has a different religion from others are necessarily the same and that we necessarily all think alike so my, my point there is really is, a, is again to raise these questions that don't get talked about when we're talking about black. What are we really talking about? Who's included in that? What, what does it mean politically, ideologically, etc.? And, and so for me, trust, because you can't make alliances if you don't trust somebody. You know, you can't, there are, trust is fundamental to all social relationships in, in you know, in any way, in any um, element of society, regard before you even start talking about race, trust is essential. And so, for me to just, like I say, that collapsing where we don't recognise the diversity, and I'm not suggesting that mixed race people are necessarily think differently from black people, but there is that lack of trust um, as to whether mixed race people will be loyal to the cause. You know, whether they'll stand by you and have your back when push comes to shove. Will they opt out and go? you know, the other direction that they are perceived to, the, the other option and go, you know, that they are perceived to have available to them. And, and what does that mean? How does that look like? In fact, we can link it to the passing if you have that opt-out clause. You know, what does that say about the decision-making you're going to make when your back's against the wall? So, yes, the I'll be in a self lightning. Um, I, I don't know the particular person you're, um, that you reference, so I don't want to make any claims about um, what that individual is or isn't doing. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, but I, I think these manifestations, the, the, the question is how, again, I, I think as Brian said, is what we, I don't feel comfortable proclaiming on what any one 
thing is or isn't and I, it wasn't again my intention really with the images I put forward in my presentation because it requires a lot of work to go down and interrogate each individual example and ask what is being said about this person, what is this person saying about themselves, what is the rhetoric that underpins it and I think as um, Robert um, touched on earlier what's important is that we we call it out and call it for what it is but to do that you it requires this critical analysis you can't just say oh well that person is doing that because they look a certain way or because somebody in the media has said a certain thing about them you have to go deeper and like I say look at who, who's saying what to see the work that that image is actually doing so and, and I think with skin lighten and albinism that the same applies you know because somebody who's born an albino like i was saying about mixed race people that's just that's a how you were born there's nothing you can do about it and i would suggest that that's radically different from the person who starts at one color and tries to lighten their skin you know that's a clearly a different a different phenomenon so i think you're out of time gabriella thank you very much.